you know, Mitch McConnell first paragraph, first paragraph of the legacy. He'll be viewed as a hero by Republicans in his obituary, especially if Trump's a, a faded member and he doesn't win again. And he'll be uh, viewed as a villain by Democrats for, for what he did on the Supreme Court. But that will be his legacy. Hello and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm here with my old friend Jamie Weinstein. He's a producer and creator of Finding Matt Drudge on iHeartMedia. It is a serial about, well, Matt Drudge. We're going to talk about that. He's the host of the Dispatch Podcast on Mondays. Uh, in a former life, he hosted the Jamie Weinstein Podcast. And I, I just do need to mention that I consider the interview that he conducted with me about my political transformation, I think the best one that I did anywhere. So now I get to turn the tables on him. What's up, brother? How's it going? This is uh, wonderful. I, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that you considered that with the uh, the best interview you did. So it was I, really I good. That. Well, I, you know, I mean, there are different kinds of bests, um, but I thought it was the best because, uh, you know, you actually made me think and kind of challenged my, uh, you know, assumptions about it. I think probably a lot of it was a lot of people that are interviewing me were happy about my political transformation <laughs> and didn't really challenge me on it too much. Uh, and so I thought that those those elements of it were, were good. So I, I, I go back, to, every once in a while I'll go back to it when, or I send people to it when they're like, what, what do you think about this? So anyway, um, you did nice work. People can go find it in the archives. Thank you. I'm, um, I'm going to give you the business though now. But beforehand, for people that don't know you, I just kind of want to level set a little bit and maybe you can just tell us like, how do you define yourself politically these days? And what does that mean for you with regards to um, our our octogenarian presidential candidate? <laughs> well, I guess the way I, do, I, I tell people I define myself these days uh, uh, less ideological than I than I than I once was, although I am somewhat ideological. But uh, the way I describe it is uh, I'm pro democracy in the sense that uh, I think that there's a threat to the country with Donald Trump. I don't know if that's a hundred percent threat, if he's reelected, but it's, you know, much higher than it was last time. And I, I thought it was a threat last time. Um, but I'm also, uh, for not teaching my kids crazy things. Uh, so, uh, I guess on both sides of the perspective, uh, spectrum, uh, I find issues, but I, I like to have conversations, especially with people that disagree with me. Uh, and, uh, I think that brings, if not, uh, agreement, it brings clarity to, uh, debate. And I think that's healthy. So are you still using the C word conservative? Are you still using the C word or are you yeah, classically I mean, liberal, a different C word? What, what, how are you describing yourself? Moderate? I, I, are you I've a neoliberal my, now? <laughs> I've used myself, I, I've used classically liberal when I was in college. I mean, I, I guess that's probably what I'm closest to, but I, I still say I'm conservative. Yeah, I, I, I'm not afraid of saying uh, I'm, I'm conservative. I mean, you said you said beforehand, I don't know if I'm breaking any news, we can cut this and post if so, but you said you might be moving to California. So like, would you see yourself as a Steve Garvey supporter? <laughs> I, I haven't paid too much attention. I, it seems like he doesn't say very much, is from what yeah. I can tell. Um, I saw, he was on some debate stage, and he, he seems to know how to just repeat lines, as far as I can tell. But I, yeah. I really haven't okay. been, been following it very closely. Okay, well, we'll explore over the course of this podcast. Maybe we'll revisit that question at the end and see if we <laughs> see if we've evolved at all. Um, I, I want to do I want to do state of the Republican Party, state of the conservative movement stuff. I want to do. I want to, you know, uh, I want to argue with you a couple of things you've been tweeting about lately. Um, and I want to talk about Matt Drudge. But like, unfortunately, the news gods like have have forced us to delay all of that just just a bit. Um, we had the SCOTUS uh, decision uh, late last night or I guess yesterday afternoon uh, where they uh, uh, announced that they will be hearing Donald Trump's appeal uh, with regards to whether or not he's completely immune as president from doing all crimes. Um, a preposterous appeal, uh, and uh, they will be hearing that on April 22nd. I don't know. So I guess I don't know what Samuel Alito has to wash his dome or something uh, for the next eight weeks. It's unclear to me what the delay is on that. But I was wondering what your uh, top line response was to this and and the political and implications. You know, I, I I always thought you know these are in the background. Will he get convicted? You know, will something happen? There's going to be an election, no matter whether he's convicted or not. And I'm not sure the convictions are uh, if he is convicted. I don't know how much that will play, good or bad. It might spur people to come out and vote, I mean, uh, for him who they think he's aggrieved. Uh, Donald Trump's a little bit like – I always think of uh, the picture of Dorian Gray in a different way. Like everything goes right for him. Like there's there must be someone up there that allows all the chips to fall where they may. Everyone around him falls and burns, goes to prison, uh, you know, uh, fall apart, go bankrupt, lose their money. And yet, you know, Trump, you know, the cards just always fall exactly right 
for Trump, where he uh, avoids it all while all those around him burn. Is that right? I mean, he's had. To, I mean, he's lost a lot of elections lately. I mean, there, there are. Con- I, I sometimes I hate like this he, sense he, of I oh, mean, there's he, nothing we can do with Donald Trump. Yeah. He just he is he's Teflon. That's not really right. Well, I I do think it is a little bit right actually. Um, yes, uh, he lost obviously 2020, uh, and there were midterms that he lost, but he didn't really lose. Those were other candidates yeah. that lost. He's been uh, indicted four times. Uh, That's not great. I've never been indicted. Yeah, but he hasn't. I mean, he went bankrupt three times, and yet he still <laughs> won the presidency. He finds his way back. Uh, you, everyone thinks he's gone, and then he, then he's back. I, people were using. I, I mean, I, I use this jokingly. Uh, you know, when he left office, he had all these commentators, some of which I agree with. They were calling him the former guy as if like he's going to disappear and he's going to go away. Uh, and now he's, uh, you know, uh, going to win the Republican nomination and uh, one election away from being president again. So, um, you know, despite all of this, uh, he he is at worst, at worst, the second most likely person to be president in 2025. Yeah, maybe the most likely. Um, yeah. So I guess there's something to be said for that. Uh, what's your t- sense about the SCOTUS side of this? I mean, uh, you know, we uh, we have a legal we have we have a legal podcast, uh, so people can go check out uh, George Conway's take on this. But I I don't think that you have to be you know a Supreme Court a constitutional law expert to feel like uh, well, that that doesn't seem like they're in a rush. I, you know, I, I again I'm going to give them a little more credit. I, I actually Are you? think think the court. Um, and maybe there are figures on the court that are more ideological. I, I do think the court wants to get this right. Um, and weighing in one way or the other it probably and has the political DC implications. Circuit ruling on this was pretty resounding. Yeah. I mean, it was rude, frankly, to the to, to the Trump challenge. I mean, it was mocking almost of the of the idea of this notion that like the president could order SEAL Team Six to kill Hunter <laughs> Biden and he would be okay and that would be fine. Like, uh, you know, it's 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 a rather preposterous appeal. I mean, you know, Bush v. Gore, the Supreme Court took that up promptly. What they didn't, you know, in in winter of two thousand, yeah. you know, they weren't saying, "Well, mate, we'll look at this in spring." <laughs> like, yeah, I, let's, I, let's see I, what happens. <laughs> I don't have a problem with them looking at it. I, I, I agree with you. I think, I mean, it should be somewhat immediate. I don't know why uh, they're delaying it. And, and uh, you know, maybe uh, the George Conway, George Conway podcast will have uh, more clarity on why uh, the uh, the court is doing this. I think we'll have more harsh words than maybe uh, on why, but I don't know about more clarity. Okay, that's fine. I, I mean, my, the main takeaway, I, I, so in some ways, I think there are a lot of people in my life, I don't know about you, um, and our Slack chain and the Borg Slack chain and, and my text messages on my social media that were very disappointed about this. I'm disappointed. I'm annoyed. Uh, but I, I, to me, a lot of that disappointment was predicated on this notion that like the courts were going to save us in this case. And I just kind of never really believed that was true. Like from the yeah. start, I've always felt like the voters and um, those of us that are you know, uh, stated activists against Donald Trump are, are going to have to save ourselves um, for this one in November. And I was just never that I never had that much optimism about the court side of this. And so it sounds to me like that's kind of where you've fallen on this stuff. too. Yeah, I don't think the court's going to save the country from Donald Trump. I, I think the one thing that may have done it, and I think you tweeted about it yesterday, which is a decision that was made uh, in, in, you know, 2021 in, in January to not impeach him and, and try him and, and convict him. And uh, it was made for the same reason people called him the former guy. They wanted to get it off their plate. They thought he'd just disappear um, and turned out completely wrong. And, uh, you know, here he is again. Uh, and, and I thought right when he ran again, I, I thought this would be the easier primary than than 2016. And, and people were claiming, oh, you know, all these people were going to overtake Trump, DeSantis. And it it seemed to me from the very beginning that Trump was going to like walk through the primary and that's kind of what he did. And now he'll be an inch away from the presidency again. Uh, so you, you know, can, uh, you can depressing. tell your podcast host cause you've transitioned us into the other news of the day. So which we have Mitch McConnell's retirement, I, I guess, uh, retirement from leadership at least. Um, uh, and, uh, that announcement was yesterday. He spoke on the, on the Senate floor, got a little verklempt, and man, I don't know, you know, I just, it's hard for me to look at the Mitch McConnell thing and feel anything besides just pure, un, pure rage, as you mentioned, um, just about his behavior after January, uh, around January 6th. I mean, I, I look back at this and I just think, you know, he wanted those two damn Senate seats in Georgia. 
you know? And so the party, because Georgia had that Senate runoff on January 5th, um, the part, a lot of party leaders who knew that the stop the steal was nonsense were quiet. And because they wanted to see how that January 5th, they wanted that they wanted to win those Senate seats. So they said nothing, sat on their hands. And then January 6th happens. Um, they, they knew, again, what he did was wrong, but they didn't want to blow up the party, right? And which is what would have frankly happened. So it would have been an internal civil war in the party had, had they uh, convicted him after the impeachment. And so they didn't do that. And hoping, you know, I think, I think my opinion, you tell me, is that Mitch McConnell, for all his supposed savvy in this case, on the one hand, he's being a coward. He didn't want to be the one to put the stake through Trump's heart. But on the other hand, I think his political antenna was off. I do think he really thought Trump was dead. And so he didn't have to kill him, right? Um, I think that he did not recognize what you recognized what we did, that, that he could rise from the dead and, and win a Republican primary after what happened at the Capitol. And so instead he did nothing. I, and is that not, I mean, is it is it TDS for me to say that that is really kind of overshadows everything else of the longest running Senate leader? Well, uh, l- let me answer that. But uh, to go to the, the previous question, I, I mean, it would be crazy if he did not, did not, I mean, and, and it's possible he didn't, but all the people that thought that Trump could not leave office and then come and run again and and be in a position of – I mean, even then, even at that moment, he was at worst the second most likely person to be president in 2025. The idea that he's just going to go away and, you know, uh, Paint. never hear from again. Uh, so, you know, maybe he thought that – I think it was what you said, uh, cowardice. I think – not to give Trump too much credit, but Trump recognized this when he entered the race in 2015, that all these leaders in Washington, they talk a tough game, but their spines are made of jelly, and that yeah. he he exploited that, and he continues to exploit it, uh, and he'll continue to exploit it right now with all these, with all these guys that talk a tough game. They're slowly uh, going to endorse him uh, as yeah. it goes to – John Thune has endorsed him. Yeah. All the, it, it, it's all related. And this it relates to the January 5th, January 6th thing, right? Like there's always a reason why not to challenge him, right? We shouldn't challenge the Stop the Steal stuff because we got to win the Leffler and Purdue race in the Georgia yeah. runoff on January 5th. John Thune. I, I could endorse Nikki Haley. Obviously, I like Nikki Haley better, but I want to be – leader i know mitch is going to retire so i want to be leader so i'm going to endure right like isn't that isn't that what this comes down to yeah i mean i think i think you're right i think for mitch mcconnell in that moment it also i think if he impeached him it would probably be you know it would be very hard for him to continue on politically in in, in many ways um but, didn't but i mean have so one. what yeah so, so what? what isn't that yeah, his whole I mean, thing also is, isn't his whole legacy supreme court he did it already I guess he wouldn't have been the longest running Senate leader. So you wouldn't have the Cal Ripken record. You'd be whoever's second for the most most straight baseball, most straight game plays, Lou Gehrig. He had a pretty okay career, I think. I some JVL can check me if that's right. It's been a while since I did baseball trivia. But like Tim, right, that's it. He's not like he did anything. It's not like he was he like had this big agenda item he wanted to do the last two years. Tim, what is amazing to me, and it still is, and I and I'm still in awe of it is the number of people that are either powerful and could get a great job after leaving wherever they are now or already wealthy, like bending over and humiliating themselves in order to stay in good graces with Donald Trump. I mean, look at Vivek Ramos. I mean, the guy's a billionaire, and yet he's like, what can I do in order to like suck up to Donald Trump? And I, is it, like, I don't get the the value of that. You think that at some point, these people say, you know, F you, this isn't worth it. My dignity is worth it. But in Washington, it seems like dignity is very low on the totem pole of, of what matters. And I just want to mention one more thing. And, and uh, like, I hope Nikki Haley rises somehow and beats Donald Trump in this primary. Uh, so, I, like, that would be wonderful. Sure. And I think she, she's way better than, than Donald Trump. The odds that she comes and endorses Donald Trump after she loses this primary are Greater than fifty percent. Uh, they're, 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 greater than ninety on this yeah, podcast. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, every I, I'm I'm ho- everybody. I, I don't want to take anybody's hope away. You know, yeah. hope dies last, but it's greater than ninety on this podcast. You know, maybe I'm I'm starting to be convinced that maybe Chris Christie won't do it again. But I'm not a hundred percent convinced that Chris Christie doesn't come out and endorse Donald Trump uh, in the end. Um, he's really trying to make it clear he's not, but. Yeah, back to McConnell before we leave. So you, so the answer to your T, uh, you didn't get to the TDS question. Uh, you, yeah. you, you have my level at least of Trump derangement. Like there's not like <laughs> right, uh, you know, Mitch McConnell first paragraph, first paragraph of the legacy is this right? 
Now, I, I was thinking about it, um, and I think the answer is we don't know yet, and it depends what happens in the future, right? If Donald Trump wins, and especially if it's as catastrophic as the worst case scenarios, of course that is the the first uh, um, paragraph in his obituary, and if it's written by certain papers, it will be no matter what. Um, if, on the other hand, Trump loses, uh, so you know it didn't matter all that much in the end, other than you know he wasn't able to get a, another a Republican that could actually win uh, uh, to be the nominee. Um, I think it will be the Supreme Court. I think it will be uh, a master of Senate maneuvers who helped create, create a Supreme Court that's conservative for a generation. So, I mean, the answer I think to that w- is depends what happens. But you and me both know the risk that he took by not doing that. You know, should should probably be uh, preeminent. And yeah. even if Trump doesn't win, he still took a great risk that put him in that position to win. But that's not how I think these things happen. We Especially have because he knew. I and mean, the risk to yeah. me, it's like he's told us he knew. Yeah. Right? Like he said it on the Senate floor. It's not like it was. It's not like it was. Oh, you know, he was too dumb, or he didn't see the threat from Donald Trump clearly, or he didn't recognize you know what i mean uh he, here he was under the impression that donald trump didn't do anything wrong like your boy dan crenshaw who we'll get to in a second um uh, <laughs> it wasn't like any of that like he went on the senate floor and was like no you did this it was your fault and then but i can't do anything about it because something something it was too, we had to go on vacation after christmas after christmas and we had to take a couple weeks off and then you were gone and i guess we can't convict somebody who's gone technically by some rule i just made up about post concert right like that that's the most telling yeah. part of it we we get a lot of these really powerful speeches against Donald Trump. We get, you know, Mitch McConnell and Ted Cruz at the convention, all these righteous speeches. Every concession all, speech. Yeah, it's all BS. All BS. Like, they're not like that, that <laughs> upset about him. Uh, uh, that no one actually has that strong of a position uh, because it all fades like three weeks later. All right. So here's uh, here's my one more Mitch McConnell thing we need to hash out. To, so you can you can grade how deep into the you know resistance Kool Aid I've gotten um, since leaving the Republican Party. But uh, some of my old friends get mad at me when I say that like functionally he stole a Supreme Court seat. I mean he didn't like he didn't literally steal one, but like functionally we had it was a situation where in a reg, in a normal working system where you, you would have ways that you appoint judges. There would be norms. You would, both sides would respect them. And, you know, you would, uh, you know, the rules would be the same, no matter who's the president, which party's president, which party's the Senate. That, like, didn't really happen, right? Like, the, there were two situations. They were exactly, the, they weren't even exactly the same. In the one case, the, the, the justice left, like, with many months before the election. In the other case, the, just, the justice died right before the election. And, um, and he was in charge of the Senate, and he did things differently for two different nominees based on no real principle, except like a made up principle um, about, about election year, you know, uh, appointments. And as a result, they, the you know, conservative side of the bench got an extra seat. So like stole is like an okay word to use. When I say stole, conservatives get really mad, really mad. They're like, Oh, Tim, like this is joy Reid, MSNBC stuff. And I'm like, I don't, I don't really think so. I mean, functionally he stole one. I, I don't, I'm not going to get upset at you at it, but I, I think that I think the reality is that the the Supreme Court fights uh, have had been, I should say, existential in a certain sense because of Roe v. Wade, and and I think the Democrats ratcheted up to begin with uh, in the way with you know starting with Bork and other places, uh, and you know uh, the attacks on Alito uh, 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 that attacked his character for being a racist, I think, was very thin. Um, so you know you have these escalating adventures and I believe the Democrats would have done the same thing in the same position all over Roe v. Wade. You and do? I did, yeah, I do. And do I think, you, do you think that this democratic party, you think Chuck Schumer, these guys that like haven't even brought Jared Kushner up for a hearing, <laughs> you know, you think, you think these guys would have held a Supreme court seat for 10 months? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I don't know. So my point was going to be, I don't know anymore because I do think the interesting question is now Roe v. Wade is overturned will be interesting it'll be interesting to see what happens post roe v wade because i do think roe v wade obviously there are other decisions that that matter but i do think that uh court case was in many ways kind of this escalatory uh uh impetus uh for these supreme court fights um uh so i i do believe that that in that 
moment. Uh, the Democrats would have would have would have would have probably done the same thing, whether it's right or wrong. Um, and I think at the end of the day, the, the Democrats, you know, why, why did uh, you know uh, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg stay as long as she did? I mean, there, there's so many questions that you could ask. The Democrats could have yeah. better control of the court than they do. Sure, um, but yeah, I mean, um, he'll be viewed as a hero. Uh, uh, by Republicans in his obituary, especially if Trump's a, a faded member and he doesn't win again, and and he'll be uh, viewed as a villain by Democrats for for what he did on the Supreme Court. But that will be his legacy. So not stall for you. I no, I, I wouldn't. I, I mean, you know, what, what word are we going to use? Can we use can we use the word aggress aggressively <laughs> <laughs> aggressively seized <laughs> aggressively seized maybe a bonus Supreme Court seat. Legislatively maneuvered, I maneuvered. You know, maneuvered. I you know, I, I have to go back in time to read. You know, the the arguments for and against. I, I, I at the time I think it was pretty clever, but then again, you know, you could argue in the same way it would be clever to put more f- seats on the Supreme Court. I, I guess. Um, right. So I, I think it would be good not to. I just get to, I just to, get a little flummoxed. It's fair. I, I'm I'm going to let you wiggle out of that one. It's just I get a little flummoxed when it's like because you do it's it's accepted really on the right to be like. The treatment of Kavanaugh radicalized me, and like now, like that's a comment. That, like, like the Dem- way Democrats treated Kavanaugh radicalized me, and like made me very, you know, pushed me towards Trump's side. You hear this from from people, and like, I, yeah, I, I, I actually wasn't really so keen on the uh, Kavanaugh treatment, but you know, it's like Kavanaugh's on the Supreme Court. Yeah. Merrick Garland's fucking things up at the Department of Justice. So, so like, I don't know how I could, you know, the sometimes I think that the, you know, fake outrage, the outrage side of this stuff gets a little performative. Yeah. I mean, I do think there are people that say that's how they came back to, it's usually like the, the moment they came to Trump. And the other yeah. one, how they the sort of supported Trump the first time is Romney, the way Romney was treated ra- radicalized oh, them. God, I can't even do this. I can't yeah. even do that one. <laughs> That one makes me so mad, Jamie. Like, I was so, 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 and I was like, so, so when like somebody is like, I'm a blogger for the Federalist, and Mitt Romney's treatment radicalized me, and I'm like, why did it radicalize you? It didn't radicalize Mitt Romney. It didn't <laughs> radicalize Mitt or Ann Romney, and it radicalized you, yeah. like a mean well, I, super pack ad. What about the birtherism? Did birtherism radicalize you into being? A, I just, I, I hate it so much. Well, I think it, you know, so a, I, I do think he was mistreated, but b doesn't like justify like like going all in for I don't I don't get the 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 correlation there but but that is the argument that that they realize they can't play nice anymore so they needed a a a, a mean guy who who like Donald Trump but you know to me the meanness was never the main issue with Donald Trump so I don't get get uh, that justification yeah okay all right i want to move on um you did an interview that that prompted me to to remind me to reach out um, that I was listening to driving around Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago with Dan Crenshaw and it nearly nearly caused me to take the car off the road. So I encourage people to listen to it and it's full um, on your Monday Dispatch podcast. So I, I guess um, Jamie, I wanted to uh, ask you. Well, just at the top line, um, uh, you you probably don't want to insult interview guests um which i understand so i'm not going to i'm not going to put you in that place so i'm just going to speak about my perspective of it I, I his whole tone to me in the in this discussion which i, I was very fair it was not it was not you're not being overly aggressive was I, I, of a guy that was reminiscent to me of how i would be, i behaved like in like ninth grade when i was in trouble with my mother or a teacher and i was like screw you this is stupid. I don't have to do this homework. I know how to do this. Like he, like he just, he had a very kind of like condescending too cool for this. I'm, I don't, I'm not having fun. I don't enjoy this. And I say that because not, not to insult him really, but because I think the context of this is important because right around the time you did that interview, Mike Gallagher, you know, who is another in this kind of more traditional, whatever you want to call it, McCain, Bush, Reagan ish, Republican v- vein left Congress at age 39. And I listened to that Crenshaw interview and I was like, I, this guy doesn't seem like he's having a good time. So I, just at first blush, like you're when you're talking to these folks, doesn't that, you know, you don't have to go with the with the childish ninth grader comparison. But like, don't you think that like there's a sense of frustration with people in Congress that do actually want to achieve tasks? Yeah, I mean, he wasn't he doesn't seem like he's enjoying himself. Yeah. And I asked a variation of a question. I almost asked it more directly that, you know. Like, why are you like, you know, you're getting 
attacked uh, viciously by certain wings of the party. Uh, you know, uh, you don't seem to be, you, you seem upset that you can't get actually bills through the house. Uh, is it worth it? Do you want to stay? Like, what are you going to stay? And he said, he's going to stay. But then it, as, as we'll mention, it gets to January 6th. And I wanted to go, you know, look, Dan, you're not very convincing with that. You're really enjoying making this argument. Like, do you want to do this for four years again? If he's reelected, this will be for four years. You're going to get this every time you're going to get questions on Trump. You see me don't want to talk about Trump. Why are you signed up for this? I mean, you can get a pretty good job. I'm sure you can after this. You're a, you know, a former Navy SEAL who was in Congress. Why are you doing this? Um, yeah, that's, I got the sense that this is not something that he's particularly enjoying. And you didn't get a great, you didn't get a satisfactory answer of that. Yeah. I don't, I mean, so my other question, which I guess is less about Dan and more about the bigger, you know, kind of party, the exchange that you had about Tucker and, and the line from Crenshaw that really stuck out to me was, was he says, Tucker, I don't consider Tucker to be a Republican, uh, right? Like, I don't really consider to be a Republican. He, he sort of vamps about how, you know, his views about foreign policy are weird. And then some of his economic views are closer to Elizabeth Warren than Republicans. And then you rightly well, kind of push back on him and are like, well, Tucker, though, is, I could be a VP choice, right? Like, uh, and so I guess I wonder what, like, what is your assessment of the answer to that question? Like who is more of a Republican these days, Dan Crenshaw or Tucker? And what did, what did you think about his engagement on that question? Yeah. I mean, there are still Reagan conservatives, people that, you know, imagine themselves in the party of Reagan who still want to believe that the majority of the party is, is that, and, you know, I don't know what ideologically the party is to some degree, because I don't think it's an ideology at this moment. It's Donald Trump and supporting Donald Trump. And Donald Trump can pretty quickly sway most of voting Republicans to whatever position that he decides from time to time that he has. And now I know that, you know, there's these, you know, the Steve Bannon ideological wing that they have the America. I, Donald Trump, for all I know, is not even that. I mean, he, he is what he is. And, you know, they will slowly support him, even if they dis he, he disagrees with them. And most of the people that go to vote on election day, the primary voters, are not there for, you know, the Dan Crenshaw's view. Certainly, the Reagan conservatives, and they're not there even for the, the necessary the, the the American first Steve Bannon like ideological framework, or even the Tucker Carlson ideological. Framework. They're, they're there for Donald Trump, and whatever Donald Trump's view is, that is what the Republican Party is today. Um, and it might not be forever, but but right now, and it has been. Since Donald Trump became the leader of the party, he is the party, and his views and ideas are what animated. And and you know Dan Crenshaw is not going to be the vice president to Donald Trump. Yeah, no. Let's do the let's do a thought experiment on that. I'm not sure that that's a hundred percent right. And I, I, clearly, the party is a cult of Trump. And if Trump woke up tomorrow and was like, the number one issue that matters to this party is that like we need to have daylight savings time forever, and like that's what I'm going to truth about every day, then like that would be a one hundred percent issue, no doubt. But I don't know if Trump woke up tomorrow and was like, you know, I've been having some conversations with my friend Jamie Dimon. And I really do think we need to kind of move to a globalist, no labels -y type platform within the party. And I like the scales have fallen from my eyes on trade and immigration and foreign entanglements. Um, you think people would snap back to him? Yeah, because I, I, I don't know. I do think that there's some. Of he that. I guess my point is that I think that that a lot of voters did per, do prefer that. Actually, yeah, he wouldn't frame it that way. Obviously, I mean, he would say he would say like we beat China, like we they're they're on their knees. Now it's the time we're doing this from a prison. Now we're lowering the tariffs to get you know, yeah. you know. Uh, or he would say that uh, you know he, he would come up with some some reason where he already his policies won. Yeah. So now we have reached a point where we can recalibrate where our policy is. Um, no, yeah, no, I think I think for sure they they could go to a free trade. I mean, if you're talking about free trade, I don't I don't I don't think that is deeply held by the voters that vote for him. He he made it a significant issue, I think, uh uh to to most of the Republican Party, because it was actually a pretty free trade party before that. And I think he could reverse that. Sure. Yeah, no, I think he can do pretty okay. much anything. Yeah, let me okay, so let me ask the question another way then. Um Let's say I'm, a, I'm from the future. We're back to the future here. I'm Michael J. Fox. Okay. And um, Donald Trump died. <laughs> That's too bad. Um, and so uh, it's 2028. We're in January. 
And I just, I just flew back to Jamie Weinstein's house with the, with the Churchill picture. And I let, I'm letting you know that the Iowa caucus in New Hampshire primaries just happened. And the clear front runner is either Dan Crenshaw or Nikki Haley or Tucker Carlson or Vivek. Who, who do you think? Like, wh- like wh- and, and, or take, even taking the personalities apart. I, I'm telling you that the front runner is somebody who's running on an America first Steve Bannon's platform or I'm running, or it's somebody that's running on a Dan Crenshaw's platform. Like, what would you say is the more likely kind of outcome following Trump's death? Yeah. Uh, when did he die in this scenario? In this scenario? <laughs> he died. He died, uh, he, he died this year. You know, he died. He died right before. He, he lost the election to Joe Biden and, and then he died over Christmas because he had, uh, he had you know, his eggnog was spiked. Yeah. Um, There's I think a lot it, of concerns that the deep state spiked the eggnog, but that's kind of a side. That's kind of so, a side issue. So I do think that Donald Trump is a unique figure that is not replaceable. And and therefore, I do think the party could go back to excuse me a different policy orientation. So it would not shock me in that scenario if it was Dan Crenshaw versus Nikki Haley. Really? Um, yeah. And and or Vivek might have slightly different positions. Like he, sure. he you know, Vivek is not set on his positions. It depends at the moment what is politically viable. So Vivek is a, a personality I think is liked by Republicans, some Republicans. Uh, some, sometimes I wonder why, but 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 he is you know a capable speaker, so I could see him in that mix as well. But having positions on certain issues that are are very different than he has today, so um, it's not really answering your question like what is the most likely. But I would say I would not be shocked in that scenario if the party is you know moved away from Either Donald outcome. Trump's. Yeah. Um, so your, I would say on your it, podcast, you used to ask people. Um, do you think what explains Trump is more like his force of personality yeah. and will or more his policy orientation? And it seems like your answer to that question is the former. Like that, yeah, that it's and, and, less and, about the policy. And I think it's obviously and I I always ask that question, but I think it's yeah. obviously yeah, the former, the, his 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 personality. And and it, it was shown time and time again. You would have Ann Coulter and Steve ba- when Steve Bannon left, people are gonna be like, Oh, this is gonna be bad for I mean, he was the ideological force, people are gonna be really angry. No one in 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 the Republican Party, other than like six people, knew who Steve Bannon was. I mean, it was just a DC centric thing. Like none of those people that went to go vote for Donald Trump knew who Steve Bannon was, other than a very small, politically very politically online involved force. It didn't make any difference that Donald Trump kicked Steve Bannon to the curb. It didn't make any difference when Ann Coulter started tweeting against him. It doesn't make any difference when these people leave and and uh, attack him for not being, uh, you know, so true to the American first cause. Um, it, it just doesn't matter because they're voting yeah. for Donald Trump. I don't think there's a zero percent chance you're right about that, but I kind of respectfully disagree. I think that they both work together. I think they work in concert together, and I think that kind of that that the global movement of parties of concert right-wing parties in this direction is telling in this account like my interviews with the people at t- turning point and at these events is telling but um but i i i, I don't i think that, that you're it's a compelling point that like it might all just be cult of trump that it might all just disappear i don't but, really but, think so but it's interesting but but tim so i had charlie kirk on my old podcast okay charlie yeah. kirk has changed his positions to model himself off donald totally. trump like a hundred percent um well, will he keep them when Donald Trump's not on the stage? It seems like Charlie these days is like for ingratiating himself who's ever like in power. So, I mean, maybe his views will model whoever is – is. I mean, Nikki Haley's the nominee. The maybe, cult yeah, maybe, he's, maybe he's now, you know, echoing Nikki Haley. I, you know, I, you know I, I, uh, I, I think things change rapidly. Um, and if Donald Trump's not on the stage, I don't think there's anyone uh, who can fill his shoes – Donald Trump Jr. can. I mean, like Donald Trump Jr. might think. I think he probably yeah. thinks he can step in after yeah, Donald Trump no. leaves the stage. It's not going to work. Um, yeah, I agree so. with that. Okay, one more thing on the Crenshaw interview. You didn't even ask him about January sixth. Actually, he yeah, just I wasn't, started. I wasn't ta- pl- he just started talking about it. <laughs> I, I was. I wasn't planning on going there. I thought it's already been done with him. Yeah. I, you know, I, I didn't feel like having that conversation, but he he brought us to that. Conversation. Does he really think that? I I kind of think he really thinks. I think that. That that as a he has a psychological need for this to be true, and he's kind of convinced himself that this is true. That Donald Trump didn't really do anything that bad, which is kind of little light, little light treason. What, what's your take? <laughs> well, you know, th- there was that moment where he says they didn't like take over the government like a South. Right. Like, yeah. like, 
was that's the standard. It wasn't quite <laughs> like it. Like, I mean, it's just like, wait, what? it wasn't quite like it. So like, yeah. it's okay. Well, you know, it wasn't, was you know, here, here's the thing. It's, it's, it is. He didn't amazing. try very hard. was one of the lines. Yeah, sure. He <laughs> might have tried to stay in power, but he didn't try very hard. It's kind of like, is that the standard we're using for shoplifting too? It was like kind yeah. of a, you know, when, when the shoplifter comes out, it was like, if they didn't put an elaborate plan in place to steal, uh, you know, to steal the drugs for the meth, for the meth, yeah. uh, uh, tub, then that's not not a big deal. Yeah, we agree with you, Honor. It was attempted murder, but it wasn't really strenuously, you know, tried attempted murder. He wasn't, you know, his heart wasn't in it when he was attempting it, and otherwise <laughs> it would have been successful. So, I mean, we should have a lesser penalty. It, he, the, the January sixth stuff to me, I, I remember, and like it's still in my mind that day. Like that was like the worst thing that uh, you know happened domestically in 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 my lifetime in terms of you know. The government. I mean, it, it was it was shocking, shocking. I couldn't believe. It was I live right near the VP's residence? I heard like military helicopters. I, I thought like like some you know. I thought maybe the 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 Article Twenty Five was being enacted. I thought like there might be. Yeah. I mean, it was pretty crazy. And and yeah. it is just amazing that all these figures knew it at the time. How awful it was. Yeah. Even Nikki Haley, remember, like she she said I could never support him, and then kind of started backing away, yeah. and now is back to it again. But but. Everyone knew. And as time goes, Trump has maintained his power in the party. They all have to rationalize it as not as bad if they're going to stay within the Republican Party because that forebear for the, 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 the head of the party, Donald Trump, like he ho- when he started his campaign, he had a choir of the January 6 like musicians or something uh, to, 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 to speak to them. And, and not only do they have to do that now, they have to compare that, the, the prisoners to Navalny in order to right. stay in good graces. I quoted to Crenshaw what um, uh, I'm blanking on his name, ran for governor of New York. Uh, Zeldin. Zeldin yeah. said, and I, I got the sense he likes Zeldin. So he's like, yeah. oh, I don't know what exactly he meant there. You Just know, maybe, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's, but it's not a joke anymore. It's like the, the party line is yes, Russia has political prisoners and so does America. Totally. And, uh, either were similar, or in some cases, they're better at the way they handle <laughs> yeah. handle their political prisoners. The, not, so the other thing that drives me crazy about that, Crunch, and any interview, any conversation with anybody in your life, public or private figure, about this, you know, is like they want to they they want to do the whole like, well, you know, the media, every, you guys all overstated, and it's like, you know, what I mean, it's just his words, it's just the mean truths, and it's just his words, and it's like, I just wanted to be like. If, if we're back in the time machine, it's like if we got back in the time machine now going backwards to 2015 and showed Dan Crenshaw just a picture of January 6th and been like, here's the Trump flags, here's the Confederate flags, here's the smoke, it's the Capitol. And we're like, this will happen and you will defend it. You know what I mean? Like he would be like, come on, you're an idiot. Never. Right. You know what I mean? And that's like the thing. Like, like the, that's how the goalposts get moved. Yeah. And, and I'm sure if he was here, he'd say, I'm not defending it. He'd say, I, but he's minimizing it. He's certainly he's minimizing it now. And, and, uh, you know, again, like Donald Trump, and I brought this up to him, was like in what was it, five hours? How long was he like not yeah, responding TV. while the Secret Service were like trying to rescue Mike Pence? His, 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 his vice hours. president was like in, like, Life was being threatened yeah. and didn't care. So, I mean, yeah, I agree. He, Donald Trump is not the greatest planner. And thankfully, he might not have, be able to execute things that well. But he's also a guy who had the power to try to save his vice president for five hours and, and, or whatever the hours were and, and chose not to lift a finger uh, or anybody else on Capitol Hill he could to, to lift a finger to help. Um, that's kind of yeah. like as damning as you can get. And, and I mean, I know this is kind of superfluous, but like it's kind of an intrig- like an important point. Like every anybody who's ever worked around him, like say he's the worst human being of all time, and yet <laughs> like this is where we are. You would think that would be a data point that people would consider. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know, and I and I kind of agree. You implied this earlier. Maybe there's not a hundred percent chance that like the democracy ends if he wins again. And, I, and I'm also on that. But like my point always to these to people like Crenshaw is like, okay, like what do you, you think the chance is? Do you think there's a 1% chance? 2%? Right? Because it's like 2% is really bad. Yeah. But we haven't had – previously before 2020, we hadn't really had an election where you thought that one of the two candidates, there was a 2% chance that the American experiment would end if they won. <laughs> like that was, a, that was a 0% chance for both sides question, right? And I yeah. think that – like no matter how bad of a planner he is, like you would think that would be 
you know, cross the red line. So, so in my piece, my first piece, or not my first piece, but my piece where I, uh, I wrote in 2016, uh, I think I wrote, um, uh, uh, Hillary's malaria and Trump's Ebola. That's why I, uh, I'm a support of malaria over, 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 over Ebola. Um, and I, but in, Our in listeners that piece, will really appreciate that. Yeah. Our liberal <laughs> listeners are going to love that. I'm for, I'm for the malaria. I'm a malaria. I will be the malaria net in my vote for Hillary. We appreciated but, your Hillary vote. But, I was with you. But, but in that piece, I said, you know, look, I don't think Donald Trump is going to overthrow the government, but is there a 10% chance he'll try to like maintain power and overthrow the government? That's 10% too high. Like, yeah. that, that, like, <laughs> like I can't vote for someone. There's, there's that percentage chance. And I didn't, and, and I knew at the time, and I, and I kind of remember, I remember conservative commentators at the time saying, it's just so hyperbolic that people yeah. think that, well, he's going to try to maintain power and be a, well, he did it. And, he did. and now we're, now we're saying like, he probably won't again. I actually think he probably won't, I mean, won't again, uh, and say term limited out, but I mean, it has to be at least the same percentage chance as the time before when he did it. Like, why are we like, we're taking that risk. I guess we're taking that risk. I, I don't know. Okay. I mean, all right. We got, I've got some other topics we got to get through. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about Israel. I got, I got some, I got some reader, uh, some unhappy reader email about uh, my conversation with Brian Boitler on Tuesday and, and Iglesias about Gaza. Uh, they thought that he was a little over overstated in his claims about Israel's actions. So um, now I want to, I want to, give you a chance to discuss this. It was something you sent um, recently. You said this before, but it remains true. The sadistic October 7th massacre was the easiest moral test of our time. But since so many people are failing it, it has become the most clarifying moral moment of our time. You wrote that. What Talk about that a little bit more and what you mean by it. Well, the, we, we have never had you know, I, uh, there have been sadistic uh, attacks before. I think the Yazidis is probably up there, and in, in, in some of the the, mo- the more sadistic uh, the ISIS attack on the Yazidis, uh, from what we know. But we have not had one as sadistic that's at that level that has been filmed. We, we're able to see the sadism. We're able to see the, the level of uh, uh, of of just you know stuff, stuff, murder. It, it was joyful killing. Uh, because they were attacking Jews and people that were, you know, working with Jews, uh, m- fellow Muslims that that lived in Israel that that coexist with with Jews, and uh, you know, uh, it, it was from an organization that controls Gaza, the managers of Gaza, who uh, were founded upon a document that not only calls uh, for uh, uh, the murder of Israelis, but the genocide of Jews worldwide in, in its in its founding charter. Now. What is the the response that is proportional to that threat after you know that they can, which was shocking to me, I mean, totally shocking, having been to that fence and having written about it for years that it had a 100% success rate in stopping terrorist infiltration. Uh, what, what is the proportional threat to the threat of elimination, the threat of genocide? Uh, it, it has to be to destroy the group that wants to do it. It just so happens that this group has spent aid money that was supposed to go to help the people of Gaza uh, and, and their fellow uh, you know, citizens, I guess you would say, because they're the leaders of Gaza, and built the most elaborate tunnel system that the world has ever known to hide under the population so that in this conflict, it will be even more bloody than, than uh, it would be if they were fighting uh, uh, another way. So um, you know, in order to defeat this organization, there's no way it can be not, not be bloody, unfortunately. Um, cause that's the way they made it. They made it. So that would be the case. Uh, so, uh, you know, I am not a military uh, expert. I'm not in Israel's position. I would understand if they said, you know, there's no way we can actually do this, uh, a ceasefire is necessary to get our hostages back, but I don't see how this, this cycle that we've had with Gaza ends uh, of uh, or that Israel's had with Gaza ends going back and forth in these wars unless Hamas is totally defeated and, and and by defeated I mean its leadership totally eliminated and and its foot soldiers to the extent you can killed or captured. Okay, I was I like ninety uh, the first ninety percent of that answer I was with you one hundred percent of the way. So you know I think that we have a um, a little bit of a uh, this uh, area worth hashing out about w- kind of what to do about it, right? And and I think that when you mess it, and, and one of the things you didn't get into that I'm, I'm sure we agree on when you talk about the people that failed the moral test, uh, you know, the folks that were posting hang glider memes on Instagram, uh, you know, at my alma mater, there was glory to the martyrs 
put on the the library uh projected onto the library um so uh, we could go we could go down the list of of people that that were literally pro Hamas in their response and then kind of expand that circle out to the people that were silent in the face of uh, folks that were literally pro Hamas at their organization, be it a college or a political organization, um, and and you know there are folks that that tried to have tried to create moral equivalency, all of that. I, I t- gross, horrible, and infecting too many of our American institutions. I hundred percent agree with that. But I, th- I think we get to another like moral question though, of it, which is like, okay, is there unlimited? You know, like, are, are there no you know, rules of war that Israel has to abide to? Like, uh, do, do they get unlimited ability to kill in response? I mean, the, the usage of the 2,000 pound bombs in civilian areas. Uh, there was just a story this morning, uh, civilians had swarmed around newly arrived aid trucks in the hope to get food when Israeli tanks and drones started shooting at people. Uh, uh, you know, Israeli official, this is not coming from Palestine, the Palestine or Gaza, told CNN uh, that they did use live fire on people surrounding the aid truck because they felt like the crowd approaching the, were approaching the forces in a manner that posed a threat to the troops. And I get it. You know, they killed hostage people wa- waving white flags. And like, I don't think that there's a plan. It doesn't seem like there's a real plan. Like, like yeah. what's the, you know, like 60 to 80% of the structures in Gaza have been bombed. It's so like, okay, we kill all of the Hamas leaders then what right? like what yeah. like to what end right like and so that is like just this giving carte blanche to bb in this sense i think a lot from the pro-israel side a lot of times that if anybody raises concerns about this then they're giving aid and comfort to the terror you know that's that's where i start to kind of part ways with people well i would say there's no question that there's a lot of death and destruction i think actually israel has enormous standards and it's you know the, the standards that they act to to launch attacks is is well known and documented now i don't know all the, the things that you mentioned I, a lot of these things that are reported at the time often turn out not to be the case when 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 uh, the, the dust settles i i go back to uh, to 2002, the Janine sure. massacre. I, I just, I will yeah. say on this point, yeah. I wanted to be very specific. I only used examples of things that the IDF has caught to, right? Yeah. Because I do, I agree with that. There's been a lot of news out there and a lot of, you know, false news taking kind of the Hamas, you know, angle from, you know, at, at face value. Anyway, yeah, yeah, I'm not, and I'm not accusing you of trying, but, yeah. I, but I remember like the Janine, I mean, I, in 2002, the Janine massacre, they, they, they called it a massacre. Uh, MSNBC was flaring this massacre that, you know, Israel uh, like killed 500 people. It turns out once everyone in there, the, the troops went door to door to make sure they didn't kill that. Uh, they killed as only the, 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 the terrorists that, that, that were in there. And I think 50 people died, not 500. It wasn't a massacre. 23 Israeli troops died in the, in the, in the same battle, uh, instead of doing a, a campaign above to, to, to just drop bombs on it. So a lot of times when the dust settles, some of these claims of massacres, uh, often turn out not to be true. I, I'm sure that there are bad out that there, there could be cases where some Israeli soldiers are not following protocol. But I, I asked, uh, I ask a lot of people this who, who have a similar position. How do you get Hamas leaders that have deliberately deci- decided to hide under civilian infrastructures in tunnels? Like how, how, I mean, that's not a scenario that I know has happened in any other war. You, yeah. We're asking is uh, Israel's in a position to, 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 to root out this genocidal foe, uh, uh, that is that that is that is burrowed itself underground, and by the way, with the aid that has gone come from the world to help help the the Palestinians, they use that money not to build bunkers for the Palestinians in case oh, of war, yeah. not to provide food, but to to hide underground. And and the question is, how, if if any country is in that position, it's a terrible position to be in. So how do you do it? And and I think the reason they're in that position is because Hamas deliberately knows that that once more civilians. Once civilians die, that there are these calls for ceasefire, and that's their exit plan. That's how they'll survive. Once it's over, uh, or there's a ceasefire, uh, you know, they'll come out of of their bunkers with 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 a victory, V for victory, um, uh, uh, and plan and plot to do this again. As they said, they would. That's what they want to do. They want to keep doing it. So, you know, uh, I don't, I don't. It's 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 deeply tragic. It's deeply tragic, but I do believe the blame for it goes to to Hamas. Um, and you know, 
and, and to a lesser extent to a lot of a lot of international aid organizations that were giving money uh, and not not following where that money was going, and, and, yeah. and instead of instead of giving it to the people, it was enriching Hamas to to do these type of things. Yeah, our our, our views about Hamas and their culpability here are completely simpatico. I, I think the question though is, I mean, there's a lot of things in life where there are gray area, where you don't have good choices, where there are gray areas, right? Where you're being treated yeah. unfairly, right? And like, is there not like does not still Israel have some responsibility and the leaders of Israel have some responsibility to say, okay, I mean. We need to root out Hamas. We need to kill them. But the options to get kill. So, but in order to kill all the Hamas leadership, we're going to have to totally decimate Gaza. All you know, so that it's unlivable afterwards. We're going to kill some X number of innocents. Um, that that's going to number into the thousands. And then at the end, we still don't really have a plan for what we're going to do after. I don't. Maybe we'll occupy it. I guess. Um, we don't know. Maybe we'll we'll see if we can. Maybe there'll be a couple non terrorists that can take over. We don't have a good option though. Like the Palestinian Authority is hollowed out and corrupt. Hamas is the thing that people voted for. Okay, so like in the face of those bad options, like is it not okay to to for there to be people to to say to Israel, okay, like maybe you should, maybe we need to start, you know, going back to the drawing board. I don't know. Like maybe there are other things to. Maybe there's a lot of space here between just mass slaughter. And doing well, I just don't, I, I'm not going to say it's mass slaughter because I mean, if it if if Israel wanted it to be mass slaughter and there would be you know a hundred thousand dead, it, it could be mass slaughter. I, I I believe they are targeting to the best they can uh, 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 the terrorists there, uh, but it's not an easy job when when it's hidden under uh, so when people have created a system of tunnels underground uh, to hide uh, yeah. from from Israel after committing. The worst massacre since the Holocaust. I, I, I don't think. I think people have to understand Israel's like Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, I'm not. I, I, I wish he would resign. I think he's been there too long. I think the failure to to, to prevent what occurred on October seventh is going to be a damning legacy to him. But he has not been a particularly uh, 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 you know violent or uh, uh, someone who wants to engage in in wars. Uh, he, he has, has, has been limited and pulled back when he, he like, this is not what he wanted. What, I mean, he was there are more hardliners and the, yeah. there are people trying to push him to be more aggressive in, sure. in the government. Sure. But he, he, I mean, he was avoiding kind of this, this, yeah. this, this issue until October 7th. And I don't believe if you replace Benjamin Netanyahu today with someone in the, else in the war cabinet, you would have a policy that is that much different in terms of the war again, uh, war in Gaza. You might have someone who is more uh, likable uh, and easy to deal with 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 the U.S. administration, uh, but I do not believe you would have a, a very much different uh, uh, situation uh, in 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 the struggle uh, in, in the fight in Gaza. Because I think after October seventh, the view in Israel, uh, and I'm not Israeli, uh, but I don't think they can tolerate the existence of Hamas. And there is a solution. There is a better option to this. And that is for Hamas to give back the hostages and surrender, or at least come to a deal where they give back the hostages and get a ceasefire. They can do that. If they were that worried about, I mean, if this was a genocide, as some people claim, like I've never heard a genocide in history where the, the solution to stop the genocide is to just return the prisoners, uh, these hostages, innocent civilians, that the, the person losing the battle yeah. That's we wave the white flag. We stop the genocide. It's it's yeah. a fair it's a fair point. I concur with that. There are many of my colleagues that agree. With, I, I'm just I'm getting the most. I don't know. I'm just uh, it's 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 starting to make me uncomfortable. It's been a long but, time. I was I, I was I was essentially where you were during October and then early November, and it's late February. And and if anything, it seems potentially uh, well. Hopefully, there's a deal this weekend. But BB is sending signals that it's potentially escalatory signals to, if it if the deal falls through so we'll 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 see but uh, I, I think i you, you make a compelling case i'm not i'm i do not think that you're you're supporting an ethnic cleansing but i think that there's maybe some space between <laughs> unfortunately on the only views i'm i see out there is, is like is like medi hassan's view <laughs> and like and the completely opposite uh, this completely opposite side of that i'm, I'm trying to stake out some room uh, between okay i want to argue with you about one other thing uh our friend I don't really want to make it about him. Uh, Adam Rubenstein uh, uh, wrote uh, for the 
uh, Atlantic. Uh, I was a heretic of the New York Times. People can read that uh, in the Atlantic um, if they haven't and they want context. Um, he was on the opinion page of the New York Times uh, when uh, the Tom Cotton brouhaha happened about publishing the Tom Cotton op-ed. Um, and uh, and you know, he stayed there for a little while after that. Uh, he's that Weekly Standard alum. Uh, and you know his argument basically says that as a conservative or center-right person at the New York Times, uh, that he you know, felt, uh, uh, I think separate from very much separate from the culture there, um, ostracized, um, and, uh, that he was treated poorly, uh, and with regards to kind of the oversight and the review of how the Tom Cotton op-ed was handled. And I just, I want to say in the micro, I like basically agree with everything that he said. And I think that he got screwed over, I, but like, I think where I, I want to kind of the part that I want to hash out with you is not like so much about his specific case, but about what that case says about our current discourse and media landscape. Because I looked at, I read the story and I was like, okay, the Times is culturally liberal and you got screwed over by your colleagues. That sucks. But that's like a dog bites man story to me. Like, I just, I don't. There are culturally liberal outlets or culturally conservative outlets. There are culturally liberal companies, culturally conservative out companies. People get screwed over in inter inter office fights all the time. I, I don't think that this is a crisis of epic proportions. I don't think we need massive movements and organizations dedicated to this. Other people disagree. Where where do you fall on that? Well, I think part of it, uh, his piece is a micro, but really is a macro. Um, which is the the opening anecdote, uh, which for people who haven't read it. Uh, he uh, was in an HR meeting with a bunch of other yeah. employees and they asked him, uh, I guess, a, 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 a question just to kind of break the ice with everybody. Like, what's your favorite sandwich? And his, his initial thought in his mind was, I guess, a very expensive sandwich I've never heard of. Uh, but he didn't want to do that because he thought people would, would not like it. So he said, uh, uh, you know, a spicy Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich. And the HR person said, you know, we don't eat Chick-fil-A in this place because of hey, the- chicken. Yeah, uh, uh, no, because the uh, the uh, Chick Fil A's the the leadership of Chick Fil A's views on gay marriage, yeah. uh, and then everyone started snapping. <laughs> uh, okay, that is not culturally liberal. That is an insane asylum. <laughs> that is a scene that is an insane asylum. And and where I would say the macro in that is is that this is the paper of record. If if that is the staff reaction and that is going on and that's like not seen as it's an the insane assignment that bothers you, it's the snapping. You're, you're part, more of a clapping part, yeah. man. <laughs> you just feel uncomfortable. Maybe this is more about your age, though. I don't know. I don't, snapping I don't know. is just more in vogue now. I don't know. I thought it was like the Beatniks in the 1950s or something. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about my age. But yeah, no, I think that's kind of a, a painting an insane asylum. And this is supposed to be the paper of record. And look, I feel bad because I know people there or friends of mine. I mean, uh, are great reporters. Uh, so I, I, at least I know, like, because I know people in media, like when I read this, like, okay, there are some, at least some really great writers at the Times. It's not all like this. I can trust their work and, and stuff. But if you're like, uh, this is an outside person of the media, doesn't know the media world, and you see this, like, I don't know. Should I be reading the times? Like this is, this is absolutely a crazy environment. So that's a micro, okay. which I think is. So, a okay. That's fair though. But again, that's about the times called like the times as like, as, has is culturally liberal and is staffed by people that are elite and culturally liberal. Like this has been true since the beginning of the New York times, right? Uh, he, right. He, he published the, his story in the Atlantic you know, not exactly a lunch pail magazine. Okay. Um, that is a culturally elite magazine. It's very good. Uh, you know, I look at the Washington post, the Washington post editorial page, as far as I'm concerned, has conservative white man, affirmative action, like Hugh Hewitt, Mark <laughs> Thiessen, Jim Garrity, Ramesh, Ramesh isn't white, but, um, Ramesh, Ramesh is great. I, I, whatever you think about any of these people, like Hugh Hewitt, if he was a liberal, white man and the, he was putting out the quality of columns that he puts out like would be right would like not would be writing letters to the editor okay like it was not he would not have a he would not have a perch at at the at one of the top magazines so like i just like this idea that conservative thought is being stifled in these organizations like i guess sure yeah some at some places right but i mean 
I, I, I'm sure somebody that works at Fox News that puts their pronouns in their bio would say that they get mocked and treated poorly and that that's rude. I just like who care? I guess like why does this matter? Convince okay, me well, that this matters. Sure. At all. Um, and I don't think this is actually a cancel culture question, but I do. I, this is why I think it matters uh, even more than, uh, you know, I mean, I'd have to think about the cancel culture aspect, but I think what it matters is um, well, it's cancel culture in the sense of like that silencing. Uh, not, yeah. not like the, like the, the ideas are being silenced culturally because maybe they're not being canceled, but they feel uncomfortable sharing them. I think the notion is that sure. if I can't mention that I, 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 I eat a spicy Chick Fil A sandwich, then I'm sure <laughs> as hell not going to mention that like I think abortion should be banned in the first trimester yeah. because well, or, or whatever. Like, so I think that it's related but, in that sense. But here's why it matters. I think even beyond the cancel culture aspect is that when you and, and I had this conversation on my old show with with Ben Smith. Um, uh, it, it's when you when you staff a paper with all like minded people uh, or from like minded places, as you just said, they're all you know probably you know, Ivy League graduates uh, who feel comfortable snapping uh, to, 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 you know, I never saw that at my, at, at when I went to Cornell 20 years ago. So maybe it's new, but look, they're all comfortable in the same milieu. They all have kind of same cultural reference points, probably similar ideological outlook. And the problem is when you're covering politics and, and the New York Times isn't known as a liberal paper, to at least it doesn't present itself as a liberal paper, right? Uh, it might be viewed as that to, by conservatives, but it does not present itself as a liberal paper. I mean, it's a pa the, the paper of record. When, uh, 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 when you ask questions of politicians, you you start having asking it from a certain framework. And you brought up abortion, right? Uh, there's a way to ask an abortion question if your if your view is that it's a human right to have an uh, abortion. Uh, and there's a way to ask a abortion question of a politician uh, if your framework perhaps is that uh, it's it's you know a murder or something less than that something yeah. something that is that shouldn't be uh, you know uh, should have some restrictions um, and and both way the both ways to ask a question are actually probably good questions to ask of different different senators depending on the, on the senator if you're trying to be neutral but if you come from this you're unlikely to ask it the conservative way the New York Times isn't asking. Um, uh, you know, I think the classic example uh, is a Democratic senator. Uh, you know, when is a baby a life? Is it? Sure. Uh, you know, but who cares? I guess who cares is my question. It, like, aren't there other reporters out? Aren't there other reporters out there that can ask those questions? I mean, we are we are living in a time of abundance. Like, like uh, to me, I'm just like, really? Like, people are feeling stifled. There's so many outlets. There's this preponderance of outlets. Ben Smith now runs when he has semaphore. Yeah. Like, like there is. The, the Axios, there's Politico, there's the AP, there's Reuters, Washington Examiner has people there, the Dispatch has people, the Bolt, we just stole somebody from you and, and he's going to be at the White House. Andrew, like, like, isn't everybody's view represented? And isn't the fact that the New York Times is, is like, view is all of the same milieu, isn't that just downstream from our, our polarization of our, of uh, education and our politics? And like, isn't that, isn't that also kind of Donald Trump's fault? Like what, like who do you want the New York times to hire somebody yeah, that likes so, Donald Trump? Yeah. Okay. You, I guess you No, I didn't quite say that, but you, you, uh, you might know this better than me, uh, since I think uh, probably at one point in your career, you imagined being at the podium, looking down at the reporters sure. uh, from yeah, the sure. white house. I did room. imagine that once. No, who no is, longer. Who is the front row there? Who's on the front row of, of, of yeah, it's the, the networks, uh, ABC, NBC, CBS, right. it's AP, you yeah. know, um, it, it's it's not. It used it's, to be Helen Thomas. Yeah, Peter Ducey looks like he's in the front row now most days. Is he? He's in the second well, row sometimes. There you go. But it, it's all outlets that 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 are man. They they say they are not biased. They they say they are uh, uh, mainstream. And 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 you know, I'm not saying they are or they aren't. But if they all have people from the same mindset, they, they are put on a different pedestal than the Washington Examiner getting, getting a question about, about, uh, you know, one of these, one of these, these topics that we're talking about in one of these Hunter Biden's laptop. Yeah. yeah. So I, I do think it matters when, when you're talking about outlets that are considered, uh, um, non-biased, uh, main, uh, mainstream, uh, non-ideological. They're the ones that tend to get, uh, uh, debates, you know, uh, more often than not, or at least they used to, I don't know if that happened. I don't know if that's going to be the same case anymore. Uh, but it used to be ABC and CNN. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, if you're all staffed and I'm not saying they all are, but, but I think in the case of what we're seeing in that New York time piece, it looks like a lot, a lot of the staff is, has the same. Snapping. If everybody's yeah, snapping, snapping, that's a problem.
Yeah. So I, I do think it's an issue if if you're staffed uh, with people from one perspective. And I actually think that's the this perspective that people argue for the, the importance of diversity at companies in different places. When when everyone has the same same uh, you know perspective, you might be missing out on something else. Missing I'm out for on it. a question. I'm for it. I think the New York Times should hire people that you know, went, went to state school and whatever. But like, I just, I think at a time when we're seeing increased education polarization, like there's something you have to go to college, right? At the New York times, I think, right? Like maybe not like somebody, I guess could be a college dropout and also be a New York times reporter. I'm not saying that that's impossible, but like, generally speaking, if you're going to be a person of letters, you, like you kind of need to have graduated college. And if 85% of college graduates are for one party, because the other party is appealing to racist bigots by putting a reality TV show buffoon on uh, as their presidential nominee for three year three cycles, then I'm kind of like I I, okay, I just I don't know what to do. I I think that the New York Times should try harder to have viewpoint diversity. I do, but you know, I just don't care that much about. It. I don't think that it's that big of a deal. Okay, but you know, I, again, I went I, I went to uh, undergrad at Cornell, went to grad school at LSE, so I've been to some of these uh, institutions that yeah. are supposedly elite and like super liberal, like. Not everyone who's even left of center and votes a Democrat is like snapping their fingers and like at the, at the Chick Fil A thing. Like we're acting like this is like I I don't I don't know people that do that. I, I mean, and and I know a lot of people in the media. I mean, they're yeah. friends, and and none of them, very few of them, share my center right ideology. So I don't think it, you're you're at you have to like too big of a ask. To okay. find people that are not like snapping figures. Okay, at, this at, is, at, it comes down to the snapping. All right, we're going to do a whole hour on this. We're we've gone way over. <laughs> Katie is going to be so mad at me. Don't cut this, Katie. I want people to know that you're mad at me uh, when they listen. But uh, we need to we need to talk about finding Matt Drudge really quick, and then we're going to be then we're going to be finished. It's all, uh, I uh, I guess I should reveal that I was interviewed for the Finding Matt Drudge podcast. Um, uh, and so I guess I have a little bit of skin in the game here. But um, it's super. He's a super interesting character. Uh, he's a, extremely influential. Still influential, despite um, you know maybe not at his peak like he once was, um, and uh, and the podcast both kind of exposes his like uh, you know digs into his influence and his history while also trying to literally find him because he's missing and so it's you know a little bit politics a little bit I don't know tr true crime or something I don't yeah. know you 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 pitch it better than me. Well, it's kind of the political version of uh, uh, missing Richard Simmons or finding yeah. Richard Simmons, and uh, we we are literally trying to find him while trying to you know tell his story and answer some of the questions that are still mysterious because he you know he he's why did he become increasingly reclusive when he used to come to the D.C. Uh, kind of uh, White House correspondence dinners and have a TV show? Why uh, did he turn against Donald Trump after supporting him? Um, the questions. <laughs> Way to go, Matt! I'm snapping at Matt, giving him snaps for that turn. Uh, and then there's some people that believe that he doesn't even own the site anymore. So you know, we we the show tries to uh, uh, to to answer those questions uh, and try to get him in the final episode to to sit down for an interview. Um, uh, so we we are Have actively. You had any luck? Well, I'm, I'm heading Do you out. Any leads? Do you have any hot leads? <laughs> well, I'm heading out to a city uh, tomorrow. Um, and we have an invitation to him that we have a a, a, a seat will be open for him at a dinner, uh, and we're hoping uh, that 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 he'll come join us. Uh, that will be part of episode eight. Uh, so uh, you know, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to tell you that he did come and we had an interview. I don't know. I, I don't know if he's going to sit down with us. He he kind of uh, in the past when uh, authors uh, wrote books on him. There's a recent pretty good biography of him from 2020. You know, he he plays a lot around with it. Uh, like lets people know that he's listening, but he he didn't give an interview to the author. Um, our next step, our our last episode that just came out on on Wednesday, uh, episode six, uh, kind of goes into why he turned, uh, and then we have a big big episode that's going to answer a lot of questions about Trump uh, next week, where we have a, a former employee, the first employee, uh, perhaps uh, uh, coming out on the record talking about. Um, uh, Matt Drudge. So uh, it, it's a, uh, it's, I think, I think we're going to learn a lot, a lot from that. And I hope that he sees that we've kind of tried to do a fair job on this. I mean, we, we, uh, you know, weren't trying to make an ideological case against him or for him. Um, and, uh, you know, I would love for him to sit down. I, our tagline is, you know, how can you be the most powerful man in media? And we know so little about him. And he, and to your question, he's still quite powerful. I mean, we talked to a lot of people that did not want or tried to talk to a lot of people 
that did not want to talk because they still still um, are you know dependent on those Drudge links. I've been listening. It is a great podcast. People should check it out. Finding Matt Drudge, Jamie Weinstein. Thank you for being in the hot seat today, and hope we can do this again soon, brother.